Well, uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Ahmed, and I'm the Ahmed Salah, and I'm a president of the Arabic Club for this academic year. And we're glad to have uh, Dr. Abdullahi uh, Galab to uh, give a speech today about uh, the violence in Darfur. Uh, Dr. Abdullahi Galab uh, has his BS in communication from Boston University in 1990 and Master of Art in the Communication in 1991 from BYU and continued on to take his PhD in sociology uh, from BYU. Uh, he is right now, he's a visiting assistant professor at the Department of Sociology at Brigham Young University. And throughout his career, he has uh, been very active and he has filled many uh, positions in academic life as well as professional life. So. Please welcome Dr. Abdullahi Ghaleb. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, and uh, just to go to, with the tradition, so I will start with a Muslim prayer. And I will say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There are a lot of things uh, about Darfur, and it might be extremely difficult for me to cover uh, what's happening there within such a short time. And uh, if you, uh, when, when I looked at this picture, it reminded me of one day when I was a student at the University of Khartoum, uh, me and my uh, some of my friends from the geography department. We went to Darfur and we spent about two months there moving from one village to another. And one of the striking things <coughs> that we found that during that uh, time, number one, that we in the Sudan or the northern parts of the Sudan, we knew very little about Darfur. And that continued. And the second thing is that Darfur, which is predominantly Muslim, almost 100% Muslim, they have a very distinctive and different culture. And part of that culture you could see here, these are two templates, wooden templates. And the wooden templates were used by students, thank you, in the, uh, in the, in the elementary, pre-elementary school and they used them for writing the Quran. And if you notice that the writing is very distinctive, so within Darfur there is a very different culture. And actually this is what also one of the important problems that, mo oh, okay. <coughs> could you hear now? Okay. <laughs> okay, so one of the very distinctive things about Darfur that Darfur's culture is is, is, is very different from the rest of the country, and therefore has been in competition with the rest of the country since, uh, at least since the 19th century, since, since the 18th century. But uh, we will come to that uh, later. Uh, what is the problem in therefore? The problem is, and as the United Nations uh, International Commission which submitted it is report to the Secretary General on the 25th of January, that is about less than three weeks ago, it says that the government of Sudan has pursued, um, has pursued a policy of genocide to Two elements of genocide might be deduced from the gross violations of the rights of, of uh, rights perpet uh, perpet uh, perpetrated by government forces and the militias under their control. And these two elements are, first, uh, consisting of killing or causing serious bodily or mental harm, of deliberately inflicting conditions of life likely to bring about 
physical destruction. And second, it would seem that those who, who planned and organized attacks on the villages pursued the intent to drive the victims from their homes, primarily for purposes of counterinsurgency warfare. Yes. Has not. Where is that? Has not. Yeah. I say it has, right? I'm sorry. Okay. So, and, and that is that is very significant because before that and for the last two years, there are different human rights organizations and other organizations, including the American Congress, accused the government of Sudan that it has been pursuing uh, either genocide or ethnic cleansing. And this uh, committee says that the, uh, the government of Sudan has not pursued genocide, but it, it, what it did is so close to genocide. And it says that <clears throat> in some instances, individuals, including government officials, may commit acts with genocidal intent. Whether this was the case in Darfur, however, is a determination that only a competent court can make or uh, on case-by-case -case basis. And the conclusion that no genocidal policy has been pursued and implemented in the Darfur by the government authorities directly or through the militias under their control should not be taken in any way as a detracting from the gravity of the crimes perpetrated in that region. International offenses such as crimes against humanity and war crimes that have been committed in Darfur may be no less serious and heinous than genocide. So it is, it is not genocide, but it is very close to genocide. So according to that, 1.65 million people were displaced, that is, those people were displaced within Sudanese territory. 200,000 or more were displaced outside Sudanese territory, that is, in neighboring Chad. So they became refugees. And large-scale destruction of villages throughout the three states of Darfur, Darfur is composed of three states. And government forces and militia conducted indiscriminate attacks, including killing of civilians, torture, enforced disappearances, destruction of villages, rape, and other forms of sexual violence, pillaging, and forced displacement throughout Darfur. These acts were conducted on a widespread and systematic basis, and therefore may amount to crimes against humanity. The extensive destruction, displacement, have resulted in loss of livelihood for countless human uh, uh, women, men, and children. Many people have been attested or detained, and many have been held in Kumikado for prolonged periods and torture. The majority of the victims or uh, of all violations have been from three big important ethnic groups, which are called the, the four, and the four, the, the region is named after them. Darfur, it means the home of the four, and the four, they have been the rulers of Darfur for centuries. And the other group is called the Zagawa, which is also a very large group, and the third one is called the Masalit, and they had also their own sultanate, and they have been, uh, uh, part of Sudan only since 1922. The United States uh, estimate to that uh, 
uh, is is for example the, the, within what they conducted they found that uh, 61 percent of the people who were uh, interviewed they witnessed family uh, killing of family members 67 percent killing of non-family members 44 percent have witnessed shooting uh, 28 percent deaths from displacement 25 percent abduction uh, 21 percent beating 16 percent rape and 33 percent uh, hearing racial epithets and on, there is the destruction of villages those who also witnessed uh, 81 percent witness destruction of villages uh, with 80 percent witness uh, uh, theft of livestock and 67 percent aerial bombing and 55 percent destruction of personal property and 47 percent of looting and personal uh, uh, looting of personal property okay so uh, where is Darfur uh, uh, where is Darfur where is Sudan Sudan is the largest country in Africa and stands here and uh, <coughs> Sudan has a very strategic uh, uh, position uh, Red Sea uh, it is the bridge between the uh, Arab North Africa and um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa it is also the bridge between Arabic speaking Africa and English speaking Africa at the same time Arabic speaking Africa and French speaking Africa and also Arabic speaking Africa and indigenous languages like uh, um, uh, Swahili Africa uh, therefore is here it is this area it stretches from the Sahara Desert up to closer to uh, rich savanna or close to the tropics it is populated by six million people and it is it borders very uh, it borders Libya Chad and uh, Central Africa uh, and this is another picture of Darfur and Darfur there are three important groups in Darfur the first group is the camel rearers and the camel rearers they live within this northern part of Darfur and then the sedentary they live within the center of Darfur and then the cow rearers they live in the in the uh, 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 southern part of Darfur and this categorization is very important because one of the first reasons for the conflict was the environmental problem the environmental problem it started about 40 years ago when the desert started to encroach from north to south those who lived within the desert and they are the camel rearers. They started to push south into the sedentary areas. At the beginning, there wasn't any problem because those people they lived together for centuries, and for uh, and, and 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 actually, the the camel rearers, they play a very functional role, which is very important for the livelihood of the people of this place, because they come during the dry season they offer uh, some kind of services and uh, the uh, the sedentary they use the camels for transportation and actually there is one of the oldest roads in Africa which is called Darb al Arba'in which is a 40 days road it goes from Darfur <coughs> to Egypt and that road was the <coughs> caravan road it has been a caravan road for centuries and that road also created a lot of problems therefore because when at the 18th century or at the beginning of the 19th, 19th century when in Egypt 
Egypt started to transform it is army into some kind of professional army, it started to look for slaves outside its territory, and that cost the for their sultanate because the slave traders they invaded Darfur and they controlled Darfur so as to give a safeguard to their road or the shipment of slaves from the, this part of Sudan into the Mediterranean area. Uh, but by 1889, the four, they reinstated themselves mm -hmm. and they reinstated their sultanate. Their sultan, he left Khartoum after its fall to Kitchener, the British, and he reinstated himself and he rebuilt his sultanate. And in 1916, in 1916, he tried to ally with Turkey against the British during the First World War, and that cost him his sultanate as well. So at that time, Darfur was annexed to the Sudan, and it became one of the provinces of Sudan. But the British were not interested in anything in the Darfur except security. So it was marginalized, and this marginalization started and continued with Darfur till this very day. Um, <clears throat> Darfur is divided into regions. Some people, they have their dars, for example, the Masali, they have their dar, the fort, they have their dars, the birta, and, and they have their homes. And these homes, they are very, um, they, 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 are, they are maps of that, and they are, these are the territories of those groups. And the only group that doesn't have a dar and doesn't have a territory is the common nomads who live here. And those common nomads, they think that this is God's land, so they could go wherever they go. Nobody should restrict them. And at that time, before the drought, they were welcomed during the dry season and they go back to their territory. Within the dry season, they started to get in to this place and to, to stay. So conflict is started. What made the conflict worse is that one day, there was a guy here called Muammar Gaddafi and Gaddafi, he got fed up of the Arab politics, so he decided to expand his empire within this part of Africa. In this part of Africa, where there are Arabic-speaking Africans, he decided to promote an ideology of Arabism. And he created a legion called the Islamic Legion. And the Islamic Legion is made of Arabic-speaking nomads from this part and from Chad. And what happened, Gaddafi's legion was defeated, and he abandoned his dream of having a larger Islamic empire within this part of Africa. But what happened, those people, they came to this place with weapons, heavy weapons, and very good uh, Toyota trucks. And they started using that to rob these places. At the beginning, the government of Sudan was talking about them as bandits. The other thing, Chad has never been a stable country, and they had a civil war, and part of the civil war spilled into Darfur, and some of those who were involved in the civil war, they used to come to Darfur so as to sell some of the, their weapons just in exchange of food or exchange of money. Those, 
the three elements, the environmental element, Chad element, and the civil war in the uh, uh, Libyan element, environmental element, and Chad element created a big area of, uh, of lawlessness. And from this emerged what is called the ginger wheat. The ginger wheat are Arabic speaking. Okay. If we look at, this is the picture of the leader of the ginger wheat. And this is one of the refugees. The ginger wheat, the Arabic speaking groups, like this guy, his name is Musa Hilal, through the ideology of Gaddafi, of Arabization, of an Arabic ideology, <coughs> they thought of themselves as one ethnic identity with a mission, and that mission is to control this part of Therefore, because they think that they are superior, and since they are uh, camel rarers, camels are very expensive these days, and they have to carve for themselves a place, and this place they have to take it by force. And for some time, they try to push those tribes like the four and the Dagawa, who are in the Fatai regions, so as to replace them. But for some time, before this government, in 1988, they were not given a chance to do that. And when the government came, there was a new component within this government. And the government is made of the Islamists, and the Islamist is a small political party. It's a Muslim fundamentalist. And that party tried to, to find a way to expand its popularity outside the areas of the Riverian Sudan, where the central Sudan, where they didn't have any strong uh, popularity there. So they tried to, to find inroads within Darfur, and they succeeded in that. But the conflict between, or the rivalry be between, or the sense of superiority of, of, the, of the groups within that party from the north and the groups from the west <coughs> created a lot of friction. In 1992, that is only three years after the regime came, the, <coughs> the Darfurian groups within the Islamist party started to get disoriented. And one of them left Khartoum and joined the rebels in the southern part of Sudan. And the rebels, they gave him some support. But he was trapped within, before getting to the area of his people, and he was killed. In 1999, there was a split in the Islamist groups. One, uh, and, and that split is, is very ethnic, with ethnic lines. The northern groups stayed in government. The Darfurian groups, they they became part of the opposition with the leader of the group, the former leader, his name is Hassan Turabi. But what happened is that they tried to do something about be being an opposition party. The government started cracking on them. So by 19, by, by, uh, by, 19, by, by 2000, they started to go to Darfur, and they started to uh, create some kind of 
a base for themselves as an opposition party, uh, as, as, a, as a guerrilla movement. And this guerrilla movement is, there are two, how is it there? There are two, uh, two factions of the guerrilla movement. The first faction This, this, it's not going back, yeah. yeah. Your previous, before. Previous, yeah. Yeah. The first group is called the the Sudan Liberation Army, SLA, and the SLA is basically from the Zagawa, and the other one is called the, 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 the Justice and Equality Movement, and this is primarily from the Islamists. The two <coughs> groups, they coordinate with each other. And they are now negotiating the government in Abuja, uh, Nigeria. Okay. So what, what is the role of the ginger wheat here? Because we find in the news, we always talk about the notorious ginger wheat. Who are the ginger wheat? What is the meaning of the term ginger wheat? The term ginger wheat, we don't have an exact if you ask, for example, somebody from Darfur, he could give you some kind of, say to you that the meaning of ginger wheat, that a gin on the horse back, that's a devil on the horse back. Or we say to you that there was somebody called Hami Jewit. He was a thug, and he terrorized the region, and so they named the people who whose followers as ginger wheat, and then they change into ginger wheat. Or they was, could say to you that GM3, which is automatic weapon, GM3 on somebody, GM3 on a horseback, somebody on a gin, and that is similar to this picture. These are the ginger wheats. Uh, a better picture is, could be, hmm? previous. Previous. <laughs> previous yeah, this is a typical ginger wheat. A guy with a flashing cop or a gym three on a horseback. Uh, another meaning of the term ginger wheat that say that th there were some uh, thugs who uh, uh, came from different parts uh, within the civil war with Chad and they created this kind of havoc and they called them ginger wheat. Whatever the name, they represent a guerrilla force, which is a private guerrilla force. The government used them, and they use the government. 
the relationship between the ginger wheat and the government is marriage of convenience. The ginger wheat, they would like to drive those tribes within the fertile areas, the sedentary, away from their land and to replace them there. The government has a different agenda. The government, those gorillas, when they go into and hit government installations, they come back and melt within the population because they are their tribes and their relatives, and it becomes extremely difficult for the government to find them. So the best thing to do is to move those people completely and to deny the gorillas this such a sanctuary. And what happens is that the government uses its helicopters and they come and they shoot at those villages. And when the people get out terrorized, the ginger wheat comes with their horses and they shoot them. And that what created this kind of destruction. So wherever you go and find those villages, you find similar kind of destruction. Helicopters shooting at huts and villages, setting fire on them, people coming out, ginger wheat coming and shooting them. And that continued and that created that situation. For the government, that was not the first time. The government has been doing this for some time now. They did that in a place called Nuba Mountains in Sudan. They tried to do that in the southern Sudan so as to drive the, uh, the rebels and their supporters from the oil fields. And they tried to do it in southern, uh, um, uh, southern uh, Blue Nile. And they have been successful in doing that because at the beginning, those remote areas, nobody took notice of that. Now, it is different. Uh, a lot of people, uh, human rights organizations, governments, the entire human community, now is aware of that, and now there is real pressure on Sudan government to stop that. You could ask me a question, why Sudan government was not using its own army so as to settle the insurgency? They cannot do, the, they cannot do that because most of the army, and especially within the lower ranks of the army, they are from Darfur and from those regions. So the easiest and the cheapest way of putting insurgency is to contract those groups. And this is what's happening. So now we are in a situation, how could we uh, describe how could we um, describe this situation? Is this a genocide? Is this ethnic cleansing? There are some people who talk about a group targeted. They say that there is the Arabs against the Africans. And they claim that those guys like Musa or those nomads or Bedouins, Arabic speakers, they represent the Arabs. And the others, the Zagawa and non-Arabic speakers, they represent the Africans. And actually, this situation creates a very big problem because those people, they are being, they are, all of them are Africans. And they have been living together for a very long time before this, this problem. And Sudan government actually benefited from this description because for them, they could say, look here, those crusaders, they are trying to divide Sudan and they are going to, do, to carve Darfur and they are now claiming that you Arabs, talking to the Arab people, are creating this situation of genocide. The rebels themselves, they are also benefiting from this. 
And they would talk to the international community and say, look at the Arabs. What are they doing for us? And actually, it is a very difficult situation. I would like to conclude by saying that the Sudan government, when the Sudan government decided to get into that, they decided to calm a special group which was part of them one day, part of the Islamists, and that is the group which is fighting them now. And they found that the easiest way and the cheapest way of doing that is to contract those groups. Those groups they accepted to play that role because it is beneficial for them. In this case, I could say that there might be some kind of sort of insistence of genocidal acts by Sudan governments, and it has been doing that uh, uh, before in Nuba Mountains, in southern, uh, in southern uh, um, Blue Nile, and in, uh, the, in the south. And I would like to conclude with this. Thank you.